Let such strong spirits be hollowed so. Heavens, is there nothing, nothing at all to be done? Welcome to the inner workings of the Way of White. Its confused teachings and faith, its hypocritical leaders, and its disturbing relationship to the undead curse. As always, the research has been broad and in-depth, so let's dive in. Very or Knox. Let us first look at the religion's name, the Way of White. The Way of White has long been interpreted as worshipping Gwyn. The name Gwyn is a Welsh name that means white. It therefore would make sense that the Way of White is worshipping Gwyn, with the name Way of White implying that it carries out the will of Gwyn. Or perhaps the faith is the way to Gwyn. In addition, if one were to worship gods in the world of Dark Souls, it would make sense to worship the Supreme Lord of Lordran. Further evidence for a connection between the Way of White and Gwyn is Havel. Havel was a battle compatriot of Gwyn, and he has equipment in Anorlondo. Havel must at least be a bishop, and was likely the head bishop of the Way of White due to the White Seance Ring. However, since the White Seance Ring is specifically from the Way of White, but descriptions of Havel as a bishop do not explicitly say he was a member of the Way of White, we can't be certain of this Way of White connection. If Havel was the head bishop of the Way of White, and a royal of Thurland, it would mean that the faith of the Way of White and Gwyn do have a direct connection, due to Havel's connection to Gwyn as a compatriot. In addition, a bishop traditionally looks over a cathedral, and there is a cathedral in Anorlondo too, so Havel could perhaps be the bishop of Anorlondo, perhaps being a royal of Thurland allowed him to achieve such a high post. Another link with the Way of White and the gods of Lordran is that Leroy, a paladin of the Way of White, would have had his weapon forged by the nameless blacksmith deity, as it is a legendary weapon which must be forged by a slab which were possessed by the blacksmith deity until he passed. The ivory talisman also appears to be in the design of Guinevere's dress, whose maidens also wield miracles, both of which are suggestions of a tangible connection. However, miracles do not equate to the way of white, nor is the design of the talisman strong evidence, but both are compelling. All of this implies that the Way of White worships Gwyn as the ultimate. However, upon closer examination, it appears this is the only evidence for it, and while it may have once been true, the connection is likely a vestige of the past. By the time the Chosen Undead steps on the scene, we believe the Way of White has little, if anything, to do with Gwyn. In all the dialogues and items of the Way of Light, there is not a single occasion that we hear Gwyn being mentioned. Gods and Lords are mentioned, but no Gwyn. We do hear a great many very or Noxes. However, there is a lot of debate as to what this translates to. Lots of phrases made like this with Latin tend to not have fully correct grammar. However, assuming the grammar is correctly put, as the team intended, we can try to translate it. Varior is the first person of the present tense. It is a deponent verb, which means I fear, or I am afraid. Despite being a deponent verb, it is transitive, which means it can take an object. However, there is no word in the accusative case, nor is there anything from the context that implies any object to be afraid of. 
The form of nox, which means night, can only be in two cases, nominative and vocative. But, since varior is in the first person, not third, this cannot be the subject that is doing the fearing. We therefore think this means, I am afraid, night. The night is the entity to which the phrase of I am afraid is spoken to. Interesting. However, there is still no reference to the light of the Lord of Sunlight. If we contrast this with Soler's repeated claim saying that he serves the Lord of Sunlight, or Siegmeier's references to the will of Lord Gwyn, it does seem odd that amongst all the Way of Light items and dialogues, Gwyn never comes up. Siegmeier is not a member of the Way of White. He gives us the miracle Emit Force, which is stated to be foreign to the Way of White. He is more likely a follower of the Warriors of Sunlight, or connected to the Firstborn Sun in some degree, for reasons we will get into another time. And yes, one can follow Gwyn and his son, as Gwyn didn't exile his son. The son was exiled after Gwyn's death, and therefore it was not the will of Gwyn. Solaire is certainly not a member of the Way of White, instead calling himself a warrior of the sun and an adherent of the Lord of Sunlight. Once again, this drives a wedge between the Way of White and Gwyn. He also possesses lightning spears, showing adherence to the firstborn son, and therefore worships both the father and son once again proving that you can worship both, and Gwyn did not exile his son. So Gwyn seems entirely absent from the Way of White in the present day. The only Lord explicitly mentioned is Allfather Lloyd, who is likely the supreme leader of the faith. We are told that even the head bishop of the Way of White is an apostle to Lloyd, so we can presume if it is akin to the formation of other church hierarchies, that Lloyd is the supreme authority. The gold coin, that which has the most value in the outside world of humans, has all Father Lloyd with his halo on it. Lloyd also has cleric knights under his command, implying even martial power. Lloyd, however, as we mentioned in the timeline video, is likely not very connected to the world of the gods. For several reasons, which you can find here, we believe that he may have created the first humans. At the very least, he is very connected with the human world. Coins, religion, and in the rounding up of undead, he pops up everywhere. Imagine a real life figure whose face appeared on money, was the head of the largest church, and had an army. That is some serious power, so Lloyd had a strong foothold in the land of the humans. Lloyd's name is Welsh, and means grey. Something which is part Lord, being connected to the light soul of the first flame, and uncle to Gwyn, i.e. part white, Yet, with a foot in the camp of humans, humans that are of dark, would of course be represented by the colour grey. So, the uncle of Lord Gwyn is ever present in the human world. But once again, what of Gwyn and the other lords when it comes to the Way of White? Old Man McCloyf and Knight King Rendell feature on the other two coins. A fairly odd choice, given that many lords of great relevance are still alive and well, even as late as when the chosen undead arrives. Finally, everyone of relevance that we either meet or who is described in such items as the White Seance Ring, Talismans and so on, are from Thuraland. If it was to do with worship of Gwyn, one would expect some more tangible connection to Lordran and certainly some form of pilgrimage other than seeking kindling. 
In almost every religion, there is a pilgrimage to the most relevant places on earth that were connected to the deity. Yet, no member of the church attempts to reach Anor Londo, nor even mentions Anor Londo at all. In addition, not a single person connected with the Way of White or Thoroughland is following the undead legend. This implies, once again, a split. And interestingly, a split between the desires of Lloyd and Gwendolyn. Further proving the likely deviation of Lloyd from the other lords into a position of power over humans. The item priest's hat is worn only by way of white priests in Thoroughland, and it is meant simply to show their position within the hierarchy. It holds almost no meaning in the land of Lordrum. Once again, the split is emphasised between the Way of White and the Land of Lords, a strange split to occur if they do indeed worship Gwyn. Finally, Solaire's Sunlight Talisman states that Solaire has upstanding, unwavering faith. He still believes in the true, greatest Lord and is a warrior of sunlight. This implies that the Way of White may not only have wavered away from Gwyn, but is actually no longer upstanding, and is corrupted in some sense. So the gods that are worshipped by the Way of White are not heavily related to those of Lordran. So what is the faith about? Well, we can get an insight into this by looking at the believers we meet, but more importantly, in the hierarchy of believers. First, let us look at who are likely the lowest followers in the Way of White that we encounter. It is neither Petrus or Rhea, as one has been involved too long to have any naivety, regardless of rank, and the other is high up in the foremost houses of Thurland, shown by the fact that she is called Maiden Thurland by Petrus and Your Highness. While she may be naive, she is not a good example of a typical follower of the faith. Her compatriots, however, are old schoolmates of hers, and are likely to be far more typical. 1. Vince is simple and loyal, a perfect example of the low-level flock of the Way of White, a sheep who may be herded by either a shepherd or a wolf. The other, Nico, barely talks, <laughs> but his mutterings bring to mind the item Holy Robe, it states that those dissatisfied with church teachings must test their faith by going on a spiritual journey. Such is the ritual of self-purification of the Way of the White. His murmuring seemed to be one of that who has peeked behind the illusion and seen that there may be deception at play. In addition, when Petrus talks about Rare's companions, he is afraid they may be a bad influence which is likely in relation to the strength of her faith, as they both will protect her on the mission. Perhaps the mumblings are about the church and its hypocrisy, and he refers to how Rhea may have her faith shaken. So, there are those who blindly follow, represented by Vince, and those who question, represented by Nico. The latter, are not looked on kindly by the church, and are sent to the dangerous land of Lordran under the pretense of purification. Further up, we have Rhea. Rhea is young and naive. She has apparently done some wrong, or something perceived as wrong, as shown by her dialogue when you attack her. She questions, is this my punishment? A lot of her character reminds us of a character in Berserk, named Lady Fernese. She is of the Van Dimion family, the foremost family who served the Pontiff, the equivalent of a Pope of the religion. When she is beset by monsters, Fernese asks herself, 
Is this retribution? Just like Rhea. Fernese is a strange child, and a rebellious character who longs for her parents' approval and love. However, she gets none. Her father is especially cold to her, and he allows her to grow up in isolation without emotional nourishment or attention. Finally, she is sent on a semi-serious mission to keep her occupied. Later, we find out that she was sent away because her father feared her rebellious nature. Rhea, upon her death, says, Father, and this, in conjunction with her question of, is this my punishment, could imply that she has not been a perfect follower of the faith and has been sent away by her father. Of course, she could have a loving father and simply think of him when she dies, or be part of a mission that every member of the House of Tharland must undergo to attain adulthood. We have our own theory, that we will get to in a video where it will be more relevant. In both of our example scenarios, however, it is not likely that she is very respected in the hierarchy of the church. Born into a high station, perhaps, but she hasn't earned the right to be shown the way of White's inner workings. Indeed, Petra states that Rhea's companions are her old schoolmates, which implies that both Rhea and her companions have barely finished education. He also calls the knights young, and Rhea a little madam, all of these things pushing the concept of youth and naivety. Rhea herself says, I am inexperienced, and blames the loss of her companions on her ignorance and frailty. We are not going to get a deep look into the way of white through them. Next, we have Petrus. His name means stone in Greek, perhaps explaining why he has a heart of one. While Petrus may have not been born into a high position, and may have even been sent here due to bad behaviour, he is certainly an old hand at his role. He escapes the Tomb of Giants, and has perhaps done it before, since Patches is so familiar with him. He knows how to handle us as volatile undead, and is wily enough to try and get rid of Rhea after his mistake of not protecting her well enough. Or perhaps, he was simply following orders. He states that Rhea is not worth her salt without her family name, so perhaps Rhea's demise was the intention of the mission, an expedient for getting rid of Rhea. Simply an indirect execution, so the family could be rid of her, as she has fallen out of grace and lost her right to the name of Thurland. Either way, it is far more likely that Petrus knows a little more about what is behind the curtain of the Way of White. The first evidence of the nature of the Way of White is from what we find hidden below Firelink Shrine. A talisman, the Morning Star, some cracked red eye orbs, and some Lloyd talismans. Hidden items already give an impression of secrecy. The spike-covered Morning Star, one of the more barbaric cleric weapons, and the Lloyd's talisman both imply a degree of cruelty in the church's behaviour. Next is how Petrus measures our faith. You show your faith by providing the material benefit to Petrus of 700 souls. So, we are introduced to some of the sham behaviour of the Way of White, leveraging belief, faith or superstition for its own gain. Throughout the world of Dark Souls, there is little evidence of the faith acting as a positive force, but rather an abusive force. This is supported by the item Cleric Hound, which states that warrior clerics were famous for being unyielding in battle. Some of these warriors were high-level priests sent on missions. 
Missions in this context being defined as the vocation or calling of a religious organization to go out into the world and spread its faith. The fact that they used violence implies that they would resort to forced conversions and spread the faith through conquering. Once again, this is not a peaceful religion at work. When Petrus believes that Rhea, due to the loss of her name, is of no consequence, does he stop himself committing evil acts? No. He is unconcerned with the wrath of the gods, which he references when he intends to punish us. He is not worried about divine intervention in the slightest, and all his show of decency was simply a perfect example of a wolf in sheep's clothing, which, as we die by his hand, he admits as such. A follower of the church, perhaps, but a true believer in a higher power, surely not. Does Petrus represent a trend in the way of white? So we reach the question of, to what extent do any of the members of the church truly believe in a higher power? Well, here we have several threads of information. We do not encounter any specifically high-ranking individuals in the way of white, but we do have evidence of what is required of them through the talismans. There are several talismans in game, but there is a trend to them. The first is the basic talisman, the standard that is issued to common believers. What does this scale in? Faith. The common believers are regulated by their faith and devotion just as the simple follower Vince is sent in for a pilgrimage and blindly does as he is told, so do the common believers. Next, we have the ivory talisman that is issued only to female clerics. If the way of white is formed like other religions with one figurehead, such as the Catholic Church and its Pope, or the Holy See in Berserk and its Pontiff, then it may be patriarchal with higher positions such as bishops reserved for men. Certainly, most females in the way of white are referenced as maidens, so perhaps cleric is the highest title a woman can reach. This would imply that once again, lower down the hierarchy of the way of white, high faith is required, with the ivory talisman being affected dramatically by the owner's faith. Alternatively, it could be that because only women can be firekeepers, that high faith is required for women, in the hope that high faith will lead them to decide to tend to the flame, further shown by Arena of Kareem's questline two games later. Lloyd's talisman is not a miracle casting talisman, and the Dark Moon talisman is not connected to the Way of White. So next, we have the Thoroughland talisman. This talisman explicitly states that it is only granted to high-ranking Thoroughland clerics. Its magic adjustment is also not depended upon faith. This is rather strange. Surely those of high standing in the church would want the magic adjust to correlate to faith. This divine protection that gives this blessing would surely be a curse if these people truly believed, had high faith, and practiced what they preached. Yet, this non-faith dependent talisman is only granted to those of high rank within the church. Could it be that the leaders of the flock actually have no faith in the doctrines they pass down? Could it be that the followers of the Way of White have faith in a false doctrine that is either being spouted by non-believers, or worse, have invented it to manipulate followers for their own ends? Let's look at this concept further. Velka's talisman, while not connected to the Way of White, implies a similar concept. The rebel goddess Velka's talisman draws on one's intelligence, not faith. So 
So, we have the low-level, innocent women and new members, burdened with the requirement of having faith, being forced to believe without evidence. Then, we have a talisman implying intelligent individuals do not require faith. So Lair's talisman implies the faith of the way of white may be corrupted. And then, there are those in power in the way of white, who direct the flock of the church, who require no faith at all, and perhaps have none. What more is there to support the idea that the faith is a sham? One support is that if Havel was part of the Way of White, he has defected. He has rebelled against All Father Lloyd and forsaken the church and his status as bishop. If the Way of White was founded upon truth, it is an unlikely move. Another potential example is that Anastasia, the Firelink Shrine Firekeeper, is locked up and maimed so that she had never say any god's name in vain. Hardly something required for someone of great faith. We won't delve into this yet, but the eyes of a firekeeper from Dark Souls 3 strengthen the implication. If we can assume Anastasia to be the first firekeeper, she must have witnessed something she shouldn't have. Something to do with betrayal and a world without fire the end of the age. This, alongside the excuse of not letting her say any God's name in vain, does draw attention to religious orders as being responsible for silencing her. Anastasia is however from Astora, so the Way of White is only a possibility. Another strong piece of support is found when we look at the dialogue of Patches. He sells a Thoralan talisman so he has interacted with clerics. He has seen many low-level clerics pass through on their missions, and perhaps some high-level ones. What is certain is that he has a Thoralan talisman, and he is no cleric, so he must have retrieved it from a high-level cleric at some stage. When he asks us if we are a cleric or not, it affects his dialogue in an interesting way. If we tell him that we are a cleric, he wishes us luck with our pilgrimage or missions or whatever. He must be feigning ignorance, as he certainly has dealt with clerics a lot, and knows enough to criticise with harsh insight later. If we are killed by Patches, he says, the righteous prevail again. This could just be delusion, not wanting to admit to how immoral he has become, or he could be aware of his own nature, but still regard the way of White's behaviour as worse. When we attack him, if we have said that we are a cleric, he says, take your higher cause and stuff it, you lousy charlatan. Charlatan. Again this theme of dishonesty comes in. A charlatan is someone falsely claiming to have special knowledge. This certainly chimes with what the talismans imply that those higher up in the Way of White spreading the preachings have no insight into spiritual mysteries. They play the act of men of faith, but behave like con artists. This theme comes up once again when Patches talks of Petrus. He calls Petrus a self-proclaimed cleric and scum. He states that they're all the same, those clerics, and that we should ignore their claims to do good claims. Once again, the theme is one of supposed aims, beliefs and goals that are nothing but lies. Finally, he names Petrus and all clerics as rotten. Patches, although he tricks us at the start, is accurate in all his warnings of other NPCs, so can be assumed to be trustworthy. It all adds up to a fairly deceitful religion so far. But are the naive followers or sheep led by wolves or shepherds? After all, even if the higher-ups know the doctrine is false, they may believe it gives people hope and choose to teach it nonetheless. 
but the themes of rottenness, locked up maidens, punished Rhea, undead hunts, cruel spiked weapons, and the gift of status in return for material gain renders this unlikely. Let us once again look at Berserk as a potential link-up, as Miyazaki is hugely inspired by it. In Berserk, the church institution is called the Holy See. It is followed by a great proportion of the population. A recurring theme is that the followers, and even up to the higher levels of the Holy See's hierarchy, do not know that they cause harm by their teachings. They believe in fate and allow atrocities to happen. They are seduced by opaque doctrines. All this ignorance allows the rebirth of Griffith as the ultimate. With the high priest and his disciples stopping Guts from preventing it. They blame Guts and Casca for the demons that appear before Griffith's rebirth, when in fact all demon apostles were brought into being by the God Hand. They believe Griffith is an angel who has come to save them. Griffith is of course a demon with no compassion, and the church's ignorant teachings blind them to what is causing the true evil around them. Indeed, even the pontiff, the top of the Holy See's hierarchy, equivalent to the Catholic Church's Pope, is manipulated by Griffith and gives him his blessing to rule. The Church inadvertently aids in bringing about the new world which allows all the monstrosities of imagination to enter reality and creates all existence a dangerous hell for humans to live in. It seems very similar to Dark Souls when we look at the way the Church behaves. One similarity between the Holy See and the Way of White is the use of the Caduceus symbol, the Caduceus kite shield wielded by Vince and Nico, as well as a Caduceus style symbol everywhere in Berserk and used by the Holy See. Another similarity is that the Holy See in Berserk is obsessed with heretics. And when we attack Rhea, she asks if we are a heretic or just plain hollow. In fact, all of Miyazaki's works have a theme of a cruel church who manipulate their followers, from Demon Souls, to Dark Souls 2, to Dark Souls 3, or even to Bloodborne. The church is always a deceitful, shady entity with hidden motives that are achieved at the cost of its followers. So, if the church is leading its followers in a direction that may be good for the leaders, but bad for the followers, what exactly is it up to? This may be where the undead curse comes in. What connections does the Way of White have with the curse of undeath? Well, we all know that they hunt the undead in the present day, and are likely those responsible for corralling them and leading them to the north. But what about in history? Back when Undeath was just beginning, the Undead Legend certainly didn't exist, as we showed in the timeline video that the Undead Legend is a recent lie. Indeed, the first case of Undeath in a humanoid on record is Paladin Leroy. A Paladin of the Way of White. The item description of the Paladin Helm states that, long ago, the Way of White produced its first undead. Now, what does this imply? First, that undead can be produced. Undead can be manufactured through intention and action. The undead curse is shown in this item description 
to not exclusively be some sort of random curse, but can be applied to someone. It also shows the possibility, and something that is perhaps far more frightening, that it may never be a product of randomness. The second thing the item description implies, and what may be missed, is that Leroy was the first undead the Way of White produced. This means they went on to produce, that is, manufacture, more undead. Quite a paradox when we find them hunting them down in the present day. The Way of White produced its first undead. Let us look for further support for the idea that the undead curse is actively applied. They are numerous. One piece of support is the Watchtower Basement Key. This item talks of rumours of a hero turned hollow who was locked away by a dear friend. Now, is this not odd wording? Is the sentence not lacking a who? Wouldn't the sentence rumours of a hero who turned hollow imply it was something organic, whereas rumours of a hero turned hollow implies that it was something done to the hero. Given this item description hints at a sense of revenge, with the phrase, for his own good, of course. This may make sense. You would like more support, you say? How about the Balder Helm? Which states that Balder came to ruin after a great many undead were spawned. Were spawned. Should it not be simply spawned, if it is an organic, random event? Were spawned once again implies an active verb, that the undead were the products of the actions of others. The fact that it is active, and may be being done secretly by the church, seems to be supported once again by the undead who we meet in Lordran. The Helm of the Dark Moon Nitus states that after becoming undead, she visited the Dark Sun Gwendolyn. Again, this sounds like it is rather an active process that she may have had a hand in. What about the Steel Helm? Countless knights of Berenique, once extolled as the mightiest of mighty, became undead and ventured to Lordran. This once again sounds like an active choice. Indeed, Laurentius and Solaire hint that if you aren't from Tharaland, becoming undead may be an action taken so that you can travel in Lordran, which is far too treacherous to traverse without being undead. Laurentius states that, The day I became undead, I was ecstatic. I felt as if I had been chosen to attune myself to the ancient arts. He views it as an opportunity to access the lands that hold the birthplace of pyromancy, Perhaps it was a choice he made. Solaire leaves no room for doubt. He chose to become undead. When worrying about whether he will find his own son, he says, But I cannot give up. I became undead to pursue this. He chose to become undead to carry out his mission. This is explicitly clear. Becoming undead is a choice one can make, and a process that you can put yourself through. In Solaire's case, he does it so that he can traverse Lordran and try to find his very own son. So it is certainly not always a plague-like affliction. Indeed, being separate from the Way of White, he is not subject to its propaganda, and says that he chose to become undead as if it was perfectly normal. Another item that really hammers home the ability to turn others undead, and how the process can be used as punishment or revenge, is from the Sewer Chamber Key. It states that, in any community, a few bad apples are sure to exhibit insatiable greed. If they were turned undead and banished to the depths, would they reconsider their ways? If they were turned undead, so people were turned undead as a punishment for their behaviour. And it really happened, as the item also tells us to go and see for yourself whether those in the depths have reconsidered their ways. 
The random appearing dark sign, or plague-like nature of the undead curse, now seems not so likely. Instead, it seems very much like its namesake, a curse, something placed on another. So now we know that undead can be produced, but how is this manufacturing done? Well, this can be found in the one piece of evidence not yet given for the active nature of becoming undead. The Dark Sign The description of the Dark Sign states that the Dark Sign signifies an accursed undead. Those branded with it are reborn after death. Branded The definition of branded is a type of product manufactured by a particular company, which, while not relevant here, draws light once again onto the theme of production. The other definition is an identifying mark burnt on livestock, criminals, or slaves. The flock of the way of white, the simple sheep, are in a sense the livestock of the church. Those branded with it is not a passive phrase. It is different to those who wake up with it or those who inherit it. No, those branded with it, they are the objects of an action. Once again, something that has slipped our notice jumps out at this point. As we have mentioned before, From Software puts a lot more lore into the intro than many have realised. The Way of White's nasty connection with the Undead Curse may have been under our noses all along. Our first image of the Dark Sign is found at a moment in the intro. A maiden sits with a corpse in a cemetery. The corpse is in battle armour. Was there a battle in the cemetery? Unlikely. In fact, the person looks long dead when we see his face. So, perhaps he is being buried in his armour, as many heroes who died in battle were, and this is his funeral. Once again, however, there is only one individual with him, a fairly unlikely situation for a funeral. So what is going on here? Perhaps the body has been dug up. What is certain is that there is something not quite right about the scenario. The narrator states that, amongst the living are seen carriers of the accursed dark sign. Yet the man is certainly not living. The second peculiarity is that as she says this, we see no dark sign on the body. At least, not at first. And then, there is a conclusion that can be drawn from this whole scenario. That the smooth narration makes our minds glide past. And it is this. If the body is already undead, then what is it doing staying dead? If the dark sign is already on the body, then how does it not respawn? Rather, this body is behaving like an ordinary dead body. But remember, at first we see no dark sign. At first. And have a listen. There is ritualistic chanting faintly in the background. This makes one think of magic and curses. It is not the music that would be played at a moment of mourning. No, we are seeing a ritual. We are seeing the process of turning someone undead. A normal human dies, with their humanity intact within them. The Rite of Kindling states that this secret rite allows bonfires to be bolstered further with kindling, and that it was passed down among clerics. When we use the art of kindling, we use humanity to grow the flame. We ignite the humanity. Indeed, the image of the art of kindling is of a humanity sprite writhing in pain as it ignites. So let us look again at what this maiden appears to be doing. 
she grasps a spark in the air. Sparks which can be used to light a fire. A spark and the style of clasping it which Miyazaki and the team under Miyazaki's instruction worked incredibly hard to give the right feel. In the Design Works interview, Sotaki states that The part where the maiden takes the fire, originally she just took it in her hand, but Miyazaki wanted it to look more like a prayer. We reshot that part many times too. A prayer, like a ritual. Miyazaki goes on and states that, yes, I wanted her to take it gently, as if she was protecting something very important and delicate from being broken. It took a long time to achieve that. No matter how many times we reshot it, it always looked like it was going to break. Actually, right after working through the night on that. He and his team worked a great deal over this one moment, and even worked through the night on it on this one occasion. All to get this prayer feel and the feel of not breaking something. What happens to the sparks the maiden does not take up? They go out, they break. Where does she then guide the spark delicately cupped in her hands? Down, towards the dead body. A dead body that at first we see no dark sign on. And then, after the hands meet the body, we see a dark sign on the body's skin. This dark sign starts barely kindled but flickers slowly into life before our eyes. She has kindled the humanity within the body, with what may be the secret art of kindling, but this time lighting the humanity at source. She leaves the husk of a body that wakes from what would have been eternal slumber. It will awake to become undead. Indeed, the item humanity focuses us on the questionable difference between the humanity that can be lost and gained by the undead and the humanity that is within a true human. The item description asks, what distinguishes the humanity we hold within ourselves? Not enough, apparently, to stop the clergy lighting the humanity within the bodies of innocence, or as a punishment for those they believe deserved it. And consider it, the first awakening is just like every subsequent one. You awake because you are undead. You have no idea how long it has been between death and reawakening. If you awake to find you are undead, how else were you to discover that you were undead? It is unlikely that anyone would realize that they had been made undead through a ritual. Instead, their death simply caused undeath, the first in a great many future deaths and rebirths. Why did the church begin doing this in the first place? Well, perhaps as Lloyd is a lord, he wished to funnel humanity as fuel for the bonfires, prolonging his reign. Given Ingwood says the breaking of curses is the territory of deities, it would seem that Lloyd could do better than corralling them, but could instead cure them. Corralling is an interesting word, as it is done to livestock, primarily sheep, and is the name given to putting livestock in a pen. While we know he may be unreliable, Kath's words come to mind at this point. He calls the undead curse a shackle placed upon your brethren. The followers blindly follow the teachings of their leader, not realizing that they are deceived and are doing themselves harm. As Lloyd may have been the one to expand his relevance after Gwen died, and perhaps had a hand in the exiling of the firstborn son, this may explain why Gwen was slowly worked out of the faith. The four kings defaulting on their duty of supplying humanity may explain the increased production of the undead. Perhaps the undead hunts are because the church is a victim of its own success, and the undead curse if it can be applied, but is also contagious, for example, got out of hand. Or perhaps the maiden in the intro is, as some have argued, Anastasia, who learnt the ritual and carried it out of her own accord. 
Perhaps others did this also. Perhaps Soler did. With people becoming undead at will, or creating undead for their own purposes, the numbers could have multiplied exponentially. Whatever the history, when the chosen undead arrives, the Way of White is riddled with deception. They corral undead that they may have created. They condemn the affliction with which they made their greatest hero. And they send those who question the faith to be part of the cycle of fuel. The faith is a sham, and those at the top know it. The Way of White is a tool for control, and All Father Lloyd has everyone in his palm. Whether the members of the Way of White are led by shepherds or wolves, they will both consume the flock, eventually. <laughs>